Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel, The Grim Reader. I am Kathy Grimm, The Grim Reader, and I'm going to try and remember to look over here. <laughs> and thank you all for liking and uh, uh, some of you watched my little vlog that I did on Saturday. So that was fun. I just had a hankering for a vlog, to do a vlog. And now I'm going to give you my weekly update since, you know, last Sunday was the last time I did one of those. So... Let's see, I want to start with something kind of hopefully not too distressing, but it was <laughs> it's a little bit distressing to me. I mean, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't even know if I should say who, where I saw it. But um, it, I, I will. It's um, Jason from Old Blues Chapter and Verse is announcing uh, Much of the Mammoth, which is a great read along. I have no problem with that at all. But the book he decided to sort of prominently foreground was um, The Mists of Avalon by Marion Zimmer Bradley. And it just threw me down a negative rabbit hole because, um, well, if you know about what has come to uh, light about her as a person, it's extremely negative and shocking, despite what one might think of her daughter's stance or political stance. It's just she's a victim um and it it's just i don't even want to go into details because it really is quite distressing but my connection to it all is my mother <laughs> as most things so she was a fantasy writer um in germany and marion zimmer Bradley was on tour so to speak in germany i think i don't even know at what stage of her career because to be honest i have never read a word of her writing and i never will Mainly because, I mean, until now I won't because of this, but before, because I've never been a big fantasy reader, and to be honest, I never liked her. <laughs> because, um, not for anything, like, connected to her, well, only tangentially, perhaps, but like, my, my history with her as a person is, she came to Germany when she was already a big, well-known writer, and she hung out with my mother quite a bit. I don't think she ever stayed in our house because we never had the, the room for her to stay. And she was a, an established writer, you know, well-known, famous, sort of celebrity status almost. And her, I remember my mother being somewhat like, oh, this famous writer, I'm going to try and make friends with her. And she did. She's very good at making friends with people. But they had an interesting relationship because one has to admit she was an extremely odd person. And back then, we knew nothing. The only thing we did, uh, my mother found out about her first marriage, or no, not even her first, her marriage to a person who was equally messed up and evil, and I won't even say anything, you can just Google all the stuff, Walter Breen. And I remember her kind of like, I think she told me about the, what Marion had t told her, like that she would be married to him, from her perspective, of course. And back then we knew nothing about the, the allegations or that she was uh, abusing her own children or had done that. Um, what was I going to say? And I remember my mother being kind of like shocked by by it. and But also because she's a writer, she's sort of like intrigued by the whole thing. It was all rather distasteful. And even back then. And so the, what we thought of Marion was as we were teenagers and she was sort of weird and I remember one interaction that I, I to this day I've remembered it and it's not in anything too sinister but I did throw was like got the sense that she was like watching our family life and I remember her saying to my mother wow Kathy is always singing and humming when she's you know going about her day like I would sing and hum a lot I guess it's just something I did and she mentioned that to my mother and my mother just sort of said, yeah, I mean, we, just, we sort of shrugged it. So sort of like, yeah, so, so. <laughs> and, uh, some, some, and I think she said to my mother, that must mean she's happy. <laughs> Which in hindsight is just so awful. Uh, I was about, I think I was like young teenager, 12, 13, I don't know. Um, and I guess it did mean that. I mean, it was just like a normal person. People saying, I don't know, it doesn't seem that odd to us, but it's something that she'd noticed. And it, I, back then it was sort of like, oh, she's being a writer and she's noticing things. And now who knows? But it's just, it all came sort of back onto me. And at the worst possible time when I'm really, really busy with my work and, um, and it's my own fault to, to have thrown me back into look, looking into the allegations and just the awfulness of it all, which is, which is just, yeah, I'm sorry to even bring it up, but, but it has been kind of bothering me. Um, and, you know, 
I, I, I also think it's strange that people who have, but I think it's a sign of how closely connected people were to her works that they now are turning around and tearing the covers off and burning them, which all seems a little, I mean, I understand it, sort of. But for me, it's sort of like, I never read her stuff. I never was that into fantasy, even though my mother wrote it. Um, and I wasn't into, and I hated her. I didn't really like her before all of this. She was very odd. Like when she, she came to her house and she'd say like, she was rude. She was loud. She looked weird. It's like she dressed strangely, we thought. She was just a, a weird, funny, like not very likable American person is what we thought of her. And we were like, wow. And she's so well known and famous. <laughs> we couldn't quite figure it all out. Um, and even my mother was sort of like trying to like dress her up a little bit for sort of some of her press press things she was sort of you know I mean just was a weird person and it turns out not just weird but but not a good person so yeah sorry for that negative trip down memory lane but seeing the title there just kind of brought it all back to me anyway let's go on to the not more normal and fun stuff my my reading for the week um I just sort of did want to bring it up because you know I have this connection through my mother to writers and writing and that that whole story is just such a sad one anyway um moving on so okay the Balzac let's talk about Balzac I had started I just fell into reading it it's one of my on my TBR reading from yourselves and I really liked it and even though I was saying in Instagram how harsh it all is but then on when I was doing actually it was the day of the vlog I fell into sort of a whole rabbit hole of Balzac which is a better one <laughs> and I found uh, his first the first sort of story that's part of the whole com Comédie Humaine is a really strange story that takes place in well sh it's short it takes place in 13th century France and it's basically Dante Dante who's in exile from Florence and hanging he's hanging out with this young person who thinks he's an angel <laughs> it's very strange I want to go back and read it because it has a lot of mystical stuff that I kind of liked. It wasn't bad. I did kind of like it. And, and I'm glad it was short, though, because I do just want to go back to this, however much this is not in the chronology. Because it's as if, if you go through the actual chronology, that's tw the 13th century. And then there's a couple of other ones that are in, to take place in medi medieval times. Then there's, um, at some point, he t writes three historical things about Catherine de, de Medici. Uh, the Medicis, which I'm a little bit more interested in them. I mean, I've always been somewhat because of listening to the medieval stuff, the Dan Jones. So, you know, it's like, okay, so now like a historical novel about Catherine de Medici, maybe. But I think I'll just focus on, there's a shorter list of the, the highlights of the comedy human. Maybe that's what I should focus on with Balzac to be more realistic about things. But I really am enjoying this poor... It's just at the beginning and they've kind of described how the main character, Golio, has fallen from being a wealthy vermicelli merchant into being a, um impoverished person. But it's all really mysterious and we're not sure, like, who all the young woman who is visiting him. And it's very strange still. I feel like I'm still, like, at the beginning of it, which I am, because I really, that's the bad thing about being so super busy. I haven't had time even to read in the mornings much, so... Yeah, I'll be with this for a little while. And what else? I did want to go back to Rilke. I'm, I'm not at the stage where I can sort of do, give a little analysis of a poem or anything, because I don't know how enjoyable that would be. But I wanted to show you kind of the reason why I get back into Rilke is this year, it's it's in German, and it's a really pretty book, like sort of Art Nouveau-ish, kind of in keeping with Rilke. And it's called um, being here or, you know, the existing, existing is marvelous. Hier sein ist herrlich, 365 days with Rilke. And it's, you know, it's timeless because it's like an ever, it's, it doesn't have years. So it's whatever day of the year you have a little bit of Rilke. And it is a really pretty book. It has like really pretty illustrations. And um, here's one that's really interesting. I like this one. And then it has little quotes that, of course, the researcher in me always has to kind of, and it is a little hard to put the quotes in the Google and figure out where they're from. Are they from a letter? Are they from a poem? Are they, I'm not that conversant to know where things are from. I mean, now and then a poem will um, look familiar to me, but even these little quotes are sometimes very opaque and I have to sit there and figure out what he's trying to say. He does seem to be a little bit obsessed with time or with the seasons, or at least this book is kind of putting those quotes in. 
it's funny how a lot of the February ones are already kind of talking about spring in a kind of it's coming way. The one for tomorrow is par parents should never want to teach us about life because what they teach us is their life. Profound. In German, it's Die Eltern sollen uns nie das Leben lernen wollen, denn sie lernen uns ihr Leben. I like it. Yeah. So it's really nice. I like it. And I just kind of dip into that. And then my Dickens adventures. Oh my God. So scrounging around for a new um, Audible. I don't even know where I was when I last. I think I was still finishing. What did I have? Oh yeah, the Dan Jones. Yeah. So the new one. So I started listening to Barnaby Rudge, and I actually that's the one I'm listening to. But there was a, it was a little bit complicated because my husband's also listening to it. So and we have one account, so I would get, uh, it would jump into where he's at, and he's much further along, and that was kind of confusing because sometimes I didn't even realize it, and I'd be like, I don't know why are we here? What, oh, it's chapter seventy, and I'm at chapter three. So then I switched to um, Martin Chuzzlewit. Read by Derek Jacoby, whom I do love. I mean, I, Claudius, I'm right there. But he did not, He his reading of Martin Chuzzlewit was too, ooh, like sometimes Shakespearean, but, but Dickens, you don't want always to be like, and the leaves are in the wind. And uh, it was just too much, too um, overdone somehow something to do with I don't know why why he couldn't just read it more normally you need a you need a sort of somewhat dead penny person to be reading Dickens because there's so much just the intonations were wrong um actually I'm forgetting that in between I did actually listen to something else I completely forgot and that is a short novel Dr. Wardle Dr. Wardle's school by Trollope of course how could I forget and it was darling it was only a six hour listen so pretty short for Trollope as opposed to 40 something and I would say about Dr. Wardle is it's quintessential Trollope but it makes you realize he's better as as in the in the long form I would say it was a bit too condensed and it had a lot of the American stuff in it for Trollope quite a bit because there's a a lot of the one of the main characters and then some of the plot takes place in America and poor Timothy West who's a brilliant reader he's he not so good with the American accents he's basically terrible with them and he can't do them at all basically and so that was a little bit like hard to take but it was so short that and you just kind of went with it but the minute he had to switch into an American accent he did not do a good job even though he's a wonderful reader in general Timothy West is his name so it was good, but it was too short, and so, like, it, it was quintessential Trollope in the sense that it's honing in on one person's, um, as having to stand up for something that he'll feel, he feels is right, whereas everyone around him is, like, questioning it, and he's standing up, Dr. Wardle's standing up for these people, for their situation, and that's really nice of him, and we see him sort of become a stronger person because of that, because of just realizing what he really believes, he's sort of comes face to face or he's pushed into this position where he has to stand up for someone. So in that sense, it's quintessential Trollope. Trollope's really good at like uh, making people become heroic because they realize what they really believe or what they really think about something. They're pushed in some way to, to making moral decisions. But um, a lot of the other characters were a little le not less interesting for that reason. Um, but it, it was a very enjoyable read and it was six hours and it was free so that's the one that was in between before all this dickens stuff happened yeah so now back to the dickens the chuzzlewit with um director Pope Kobe was not good and then i looked around for other ones but i couldn't commit to i didn't want to buy one and then i briefly started dombey and son just because i was trying to find something else and that was okay but because I'd really liked um, Barnaby Rudge, I wanted to I, I, I want to go I wanted to go back to that one. So now I've just gone back to it, and my husband's almost finished. And today I did uh, place an order for a text of it because I really did like it. Um, I like the beginning. It, it had, it's Gothic Dickens, whereas like Chuzzlewit was especially read by um, uh, Jacoby was more like um, funny character Dickens, like the Pecksniffs and all that. No, is that no? That's is that. That's Chuzzlewit, I think. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting them all confused. My mind is just like a, a mixture of all the di different Dickenses that I've been listening to. But it, um, yeah, now I'm happy to be back with the bar, um, um, uh, Barnaby Rudge. 
So funny, funny that the main character is is this sort of diminished person, but I think that's part of I don't I don't know how it all fits in with the plot yet. I'm sorry that I started out on such a negative note with there with the little reference to, but I kind of wanted to share it with you because it's part of my own connections to. Oh, I just remember when it, the day I found out, I had found a photo of my mother with her and a literary agent who apparently also turned out to be a bad person, who a German literary agent who did all, like ended up not paying for things. And I remember I almost posted the picture. This was a long time ago to social media and. Thank goodness I was sort of just decided to Google both of them. And that's that's the first, this was quite a few years ago when I first found out that um, the daughter had written the book and then and then the brother corroborated it and that and and it's just it was just jaw-droppingly awful stuff. And um, I think there's all reasons, there's a, a whole number of reasons why the daughter has gone basically alt-right in a very sort of kind of shocking way to do with her parents. I mean, it's sort of like understandable. Um, yeah, it's just really sad. And I don't, yeah, <laughs> I don't even know what to do with this all. It's like too much, it's too much, it's too awful. And I think part of why it's awful is my sensitivity to it, um, which kind of means it's hard for me to resist like looking into it more. I don't know why I'm drawn into these negative sort of rabbit holes and I just need to stop. Also, as my husband pointed out, it's because I'm stressed uh, with work. And so it's as if the, it's it's harder for me to sort of resist the pull of something negative like this. Uh, anyway, I'm not that doing that badly though. I'm fine. I am very stressed though. And it does mean that it's harder to be your best self when you're really busy, but we'll be fine. It's, it's, it will all be fine and everything is fine. I just have to get it all done. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. And um, yeah, give me your thoughts on Barnaby Raj, Martin Chuzzlewit, um, or any other things to do with Dickens. And also just in general, um, I think, I don't know how many people know about the Bradley stuff. I think some people do, but I know I had a good, fairly good friend who, who was a big fan. And uh, in Germany, she was quite a big deal. Uh, Mists of Avalon, people loved that stuff. And I've always felt a little bit guilty that I never, never read it. I mean, I, was, I mean, I'll mean, i read Ursula one day. I ain't reading Bradley, that's for sure. I mean, it was a time when my mother hung out with her and Anne McCaffrey. And so she always would make fun about how she was like the unknown one within the three of them, with the three of them. Um, yeah. So back then it was all kind of like fun for her. Although she, I do remember one thing that I remember her saying about Bradley is that she was kind of surprised how almost anti-intellectual she was in the sense that she didn't like to read, you know, po like more literary writers. She had no interest in Wolf or James or anyone. Like she was sort of like blatantly not non-intellectual whereas my mother was kind of into these writers and more literary. Um, and she sort of was trying to coax her in that direction. But of course, you know, it's hard to coax someone who's basically her. <laughs> I will stop talking about this. And I will wish you all a good week. And yeah, I'll see you soon. Bye.